that any better? That's better? All right. Well, once again, good morning. Turn to one of your neighbors and tell them Happy Easter. Very good. All right. Turn to another neighbor. Tell them you look great. Be careful how you say that. All right? Be careful how you say that. You don't want to hold the great out too long. You're like, you look great. Like, don't do that. That's creepy. Um, but so, so glad you're here this morning. One of my absolute favorite times of the year, my favorite Sunday of the year here is Easter. And, and the thing is, you, you don't just celebrate Easter, you experience Easter. Um, this is one of those holidays that is incredibly sensory. That's one of the reasons we love to have our kids in here with us, is this is an experiential holiday. All around you, you smell the flowers, and you see the bright colors and the new clothes and the families coming in together, and you enjoy this, the beautiful songs. Didn't our choir do a great, great job today? Yeah. And then if you're lucky, you get home and you get to have like some of mama's ham she made or some dessert or for some of you, I don't know, like a delicious chimichanga from Taco Bell, whatever, whatever your Easter food is, you get to enjoy that. And I, I think the main thing out of all that, out of all these things we experience, the common thread of all the sights, all the sounds, all the experiences that we feel is hope. Easter is this incredibly hopeful holiday. Um, like many of you, this is, I'm, I'm in my 40s now, so I've gotten to experience Easter a number of times. But this morning, I want to share with you an experience that's quite different. Um, in September of 2016, I can only describe what I experienced as the opposite of Easter. Um, a lot of you know that, that our church is very, very involved with, with Mana Worldwide. We take trips to Guatemala regularly. In fact, we'll be going in June on another, tri another trip and then July with our teenagers once again. And, and when we go to Guatemala, we have this amazing opportunity to kind of partner with Mana to do feeding centers and medical clinics and orphanages, and we also plant churches. So we go down, and it's an incredibly impoverished country. You, you really, it's startling as an American to kind of walk into that and see see the degree of poverty. But for the most part, the people are happy, the people are joyful. But I remember in September of 2016, Chuck Ward, who's always our guide on these trips, he said, Brian, I want to take you someplace a little bit different. And he took me to the, the dump in Guatemala City. And, and before we actually got down into this massive, massive dump, he said, there's a graveyard just beyond that that I want to take you to, and, and you'll see why the two tie together. So he takes me into this graveyard, and I've got some photos here. There, there's just grave after grave after grave, some of them like a single story high, some bigger, mostly burnt out, most of them broken into because a long time ago grave robbers would come and break in. There were bones in some of them. People just come and try to strip away any valuable they possibly could. This next picture is literally the mausoleum is on either side, so it's literally caskets shoved into those little spaces in the walls, three stories high on both sides. And I, I remember the day we were there, it, it was a gr pure gray sky, and you're walking through just, just grave after grave after grave for miles and miles and miles like this, this next picture. All around us, I was absolutely shocked to see that, uh, that on, on top of most all of these graves were vultures. And, and literally like filling the sky. Like you sometimes come across just, just so many birds in one particular area and they all took off that it like, it like changed the entire landscape. That's how many like vultures were there all around us. And I'll never forget, listen, the smell of that place, the look of that place, the heaviness of standing in that place. But the thing is, that particular graveyard, you got to the edge of it, and the people that went with me can attest to this. Literally, there had been erosion on the edge of that graveyard where it had literally, the edge of it was falling off, eroding down into the city dump. 
And this is the city dump. And what you see there, it, this, is, this is a picture from the cemetery. So, so literally, that, that little spot in the middle right is a bulldozer, if that gives you any perspective. But down in the middle of that city dump, in the stench of it, in the death of it, were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, of children, of families, who literally live in that dump. They scratch out what little food they get. They scratch out what little supplies they try to barter to stay alive from that dump. And listen, just being in the center of that, just being in the middle of that, was so heavy, there was so much death, there was such lack of hope. And the thing this morning is, that's not the only place on earth like that. There are places like that everywhere. Where is Easter in a place like that? For that matter, let me ask these questions today. Where is Easter in the low-budget nursing home? When you walk in the door, you already know by the smell of the place. When you walk in the door, you already know by the people that are unattended, rolled up to the window, just looking outside, wishing they could leave. You already know you're dealing with a place full of forgotten people. Where's Easter in that place? Where's Easter in the corrupt courtroom where so much of the time we find that the law is circumvented where so often we find that criminals get by with it and good people continue to suffer? Where is God in the midst of the cancer ward? Where is Easter in the place where chemotherapy is being administered? In the place where radiation is tearing somebody's body to pieces? Where is Easter in the low-income housing project? Where is Easter in the slums? Where is Easter in the places on earth that are the very darkest? And if I can make this a little bit more personal, please bear with me. Where was Easter when some of you went through the very hardest, darkest times in your life? Times that some of you are still in the middle of. Where was Easter in the middle of your divorce? When your heart was breaking and you begged God to intervene. Where was Easter in the middle of your bankruptcy? When you couldn't pay the bills and you hoped for a windfall and you hoped anything could change. Listen, where was Easter when some of your relatives got diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia? Where was Easter, listen, in the middle of some abuse that some of you may have grown up with, horrors I, I wouldn't dare to describe up here and couldn't possibly understand? Where was Easter when some of you went to war? And where was Easter when some of you, the most difficult perhaps of tragedies, if that's possible to quantify, where was Easter when you lost a child? I, I realize on a day like this, it's, it's, a, it's a strange question. And, and, and like Brandon said, I, I feel like today what God put in my heart is a strange message. But I want to entitle my message today, The Opposite of Easter. The Opposite of of Easter. And, and if this seems like a strange sermon, let me just say that in the story we're about to read, we find a strange scene. We find Jesus Christ attending a funeral about a week before he was crucified. And to put it bluntly, this whole scene was the opposite of Easter. If you have your Bible today, I want you to take it and turn to John 11. John chapter 11. And we're going to be in verse number 17. John 11, verse number 17. Just a little bit of background. Jesus is traveling to the home of three siblings by the name of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. 
They lived in a town called Bethany. It was about two miles east of Jerusalem. And Jesus had just arrived in Bethany to greet the siblings. And he's arriving in the middle of a tragedy. Verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus, the girl's brother, had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Go to verse number 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher's here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now look at this. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit. He was greatly troubled. Listen, Jesus arrives at this funeral. It's the opposite of Easter. No bright colors, but the colors of mourning. No sounds of laughter and happy time with family, the sound of tears. No beautiful music, but the music of mourners. And he walks in and he sees Martha there and he ultimately sees Mary there and they're weeping. And listen, it's natural on a day like that that we see grief. We all understand that. It's natural on a day like that that we see sadness. We understand that. But there's something else going on here. If you read this text, there's some anger here. There's an underlying question here. Jesus, why? Both sisters said it. They weren't even together when they said it. But you know they'd already been talking about it. Jesus, If you would have been here, the underlying thought is if you had cared enough, our brother wouldn't have died. And the Bible says, listen, this thing was so heavy, so dark. Jesus was grieved. Jesus was moved. Let me me rewind about five days and give you a little background. In fact, rewind a little further than five days. The truth is, Jesus Christ, when he was on this earth, when he came out of Mary and Joseph's home, didn't really have a home. He traveled, he preached, but the Bible made it very plain when Jesus said, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have their nests, but I don't have a place to lay my head. But here's what we find. The closest thing to a home Jesus had was the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. We see him oftentimes, he would be traveling, preaching, working, sweating, toiling, and that was a place he could actually go and stop by and have a rest there with people that he absolutely adored. Not only did Jesus love these three siblings, but the truth is, they not only loved him back, they believed in who he was. I think Jesus, listen, the misunderstanding of the thing must have crushed him so often. People who just didn't believe he was really the son of God, didn't believe he was the Messiah. They wanted the bread. They wanted the miracles. They didn't really believe in who he was. And the amazing thing is these three siblings believed it so much that there was a scene where Mary actually took her hair down. And in that culture, that was unheard of. And she washed Jesus' feet and and literally washed his feet with her tears. And she took her hair down and dried his feet with her hair. And the whole thing was like she was saying, Jesus, we not only love you, we believe in who you are. So when Lazarus got sick, you have to understand that when these sisters sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was sick, they had no doubts that he loved them. 
And they had no doubts that he had the power to heal their brother with just a spoken word. They'd seen him do it before. And so literally in the text, in the first couple of verses, they literally send word to Jesus. He's about 20 miles away. The word is, the one who you love is sick, Jesus. They don't even ask him for anything because they know he loves us and he's so powerful. If he knows Lazarus is sick, he's going to heal him. If you have your Bible open, look at verse 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And, and he literally, this, this person that came and said, the sisters said, Lazarus is sick, and, and, and what do you want us to tell him? Go tell him this sickness is not unto death. This sickness is for the glory of God. And you know that messenger leaves out like happy. He's going to heal him. And when he arrives back there with Mary and Martha, he said, listen, don't worry. This sickness is not unto death. This is for the glory of God. And the sisters start crying. They start hugging. They go and put a cold cloth on Lazarus' forehead. And they tell him, don't worry, brother. Listen, the master said, this sickness is not unto death. Don't you worry about it. You're going to get better. And two days later, he dies. Two days later. He's gone. And the sisters don't know what to think. Listen, I know, I know for a fact, God put this message so strong on my heart. There's somebody sitting in here today. I would imagine a lot of somebodies. You know exactly what it is to feel in your heart of hearts like God is about to give you a breakthrough. God is about to deliver you. God is about to do something great, and instead of getting better, stuff gets worse. There are people in here, you honestly believed, if God loves me, and he does, and if God has all the power in the universe, and he does, I know he won't let me or my family go through this. Then he did. Where's Easter in the middle of all that? Listen, I want to pose this question. I, I'm, I'm scared to death. Listen, I'm scared to death of church just becoming a place where we like put on our nice clothes and we put on our nice smiles and we come together and we do a little routine and we sing our little songs and we bail out and go home. Listen, if this is just a ceremony, it's a waste of time. The Apostle Paul who penned over the half, half the New Testament, he said, listen, if we're just playing games with this, if it's not real, if it's not true, if it can't meet us in the harshest moments of life, down in the mud and the blood, let's do away with it. Let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Paul said, I don't want to be in church if it's not real. I want to be at the bar. I don't want to be playing this game if it can't meet me in the hardest points of life. I want to live my life for all it's worth, trash my body till it's gone. But Paul believed this was real. This was true. And in the most difficult moments of life, there was something so valuable, so beautiful, so true, that it could change everything. On this Easter Sunday morning, I want to ask this question. How do we keep our Easter hope when what we experience is so often the opposite of Easter? How do we keep our Easter hope alive when what we experience so often is the opposite of Easter? Listen, if you've suffered and you made it through, but maybe it changed your view of God a little bit. Some of you suffered and you made it through, but you've never served him the same since. And that's why, listen, there's that seed of bitterness in the back of your heart that's kept you from ever risking again. I'm not going to, listen, God, that's fine. Do what you want. You're God. But I'm not going to risk anything for you again. I'm not going to invest anything. I'm going to keep my resources close. I'm going to keep my heart a little bit sheltered lest you let me down again. 
You may be here this morning riding right through the middle of a storm that you just don't understand. God, how in the world, how could you say you love me and let this happen? How could you be all powerful and watch this happen? How do we keep our hope? How do we keep Easter alive when we see the opposite around us? I want to give you a few thoughts this morning. The first one is this, my friends. I want to say this. If this book is anything more than mythology, and if it's mythology, let's put extra trash cans out and dump it on the way out. But if it's true, it promises us one thing, and that is that Jesus cares. Would you look with me at verse number 33? Chapter 11, verse number 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And Jesus said, where have you laid him? Where's Lazarus? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And the shortest verse in the entire Bible, Jesus wept. He lost it. He put his chin on his chest and he cried like a child. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Well, look, he must love him. Look at that. But if he really loved him, wouldn't he have delivered him from this? It's the age-old question, isn't it? Jesus wept. You know, I, I've been now a pastor. I started this thing young, uh, relatively young. And so it's been 20 plus years now that I've been going to weddings, going and dedicating babies. And we've had a baby boom around here, and it's beautiful. But I've also been there at the funerals, and I've also been there when parents lost children, and I've been there after cancer diagnosis, and I've been there with people in the middle of suicidal thoughts and seen some of the darkest, heaviest stuff imaginable. And here's the thing I've absolutely come to believe. Listen, in the middle of all that, when you are weeping your heart out, I want to tell you something. Jesus is weeping too. He loves you. He knows God knows. You say, how do you know that, Brian? Because God put his son on a cross. Here's the thing, listen. If God was willing to let his son get tortured and beaten and spit on and his beard plucked out and crowned with thorns and beaten like a dog and nailed to a cross. And while he's hanging there saying, Father, why have you forsaken me? He lets him stay hanging there. If God would do that to his own son, there must be some things about life that I can't see yet. There must be some things about life that I can't understand yet. There must be some things from his perspective that make that short-term suffering worth it in the long term. Oh, listen, everything that has ever touched your life, it wasn't random, it wasn't just the devil, it passed through the mighty hands of God. And here's the thing you got to remember, that could mean he's a cruel God. That could mean he's an uncaring God. Unless you realize the hand that your pain passed through were nail-pierced hands. Jesus went through it all and God led him and God watched him hanging there. If you suffered, so did Jesus. Have you been abused? So was Jesus. Have you seen terrible things? So did Jesus. Have you lost a child? So did God. The Bible makes 
unmistakably plain in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And and y'all, there's a lot of moments in my life where I just don't get it, and frankly, I'm angry about it, because God, how could could you love me? How could you be all-powerful? How could you? And you know where he brings me back to every time is the foot of that cross. Because if he let his son go through that, There are some things I can't see and some things I don't know that make the temporary pain worth it in the end. Here's a second thought. Jesus cares. We could end the sermon there and just say, well, Jesus cares. I mean, whatever you're going through is horrible. He may allow you to go through it. He may allow you to have the opposite of Easter, but don't worry. He cares, but thank God Jesus clarifies Look at John eleven twenty one. 21. Jesus is going to explain a little bit, and I pray it'll be a help to somebody today. John eleven twenty one. 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God the Father, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. I know the theology, God, about one day his soul will blah, 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 come back. Yeah, I know. It didn't help me a lot today, but I know. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Wait a minute. (laughs) We just saw him die, Jesus. He's been in the tomb for four days. What do you mean? The one that believes in you will never die. What is he saying? Go back to verse 4. He made this comment before he died. Remember this? When Jesus heard that he was sick, he said, "This this sickness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. But wait a minute, Jesus. He died. You know what I believe Jesus was saying? Listen, this sickness does not lead to death as if that's the end. It leads through death. Oh, listen, you think this is the end. You think this is the finish line. But I'm telling you, it doesn't end here. Beyond death is something more. The Bible makes it plain, y'all. Listen to me. Death is not a period in the story of your life. It is only a comma. Death is not a terminus. It is only a tunnel. Death is not the ending. It simply marks a new beginning. Rick Warren said it like this. This life is not all there is. Life on earth is just the dress rehearsal before the real production. You will spend far more time on the other side of death in eternity than you will here. Earth is the staging area, the preschool, the tryout for your life in eternity. It is the practice workout before the actual game, the warm-up lap before the race begins. This life, listen, is preparation for the next. How can that be true? James chapter 2 said, the body without the spirit is dead. Ecclesiastes says, speaking about death, death, the dust will return to the earth as it was. The spirit will return into God who gave it. Here's what that means first and foremost. Your soul, your spirit, your personality, the essential you, the thing beyond the physical that makes you you will never die. The Bible says when your body is laid to rest, Your personality, your soul, your spirit, the essential you lives on. That's why Paul said for Christians in 2 Corinthians 5, we are always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. Yes, we're of good courage. We'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And so one thing Jesus is saying here is, listen, I know he just died physically, but I want to tell you, I'm the resurrection and the life, and who Lazarus really is did not die. He went to be with God immediately. But friend, there's more to the story. And if we ended it right there, we would end it short of the point. 
Because the reality is, Jesus didn't just say there's life after death. He said, I want to show you something else. Look at verse 38. Ooh, I've been waiting on this for a long time. Verse 38. How many of you glad you came today? Say amen. amen. Luke eleven thirty-eight. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time, there'll be an odor. I think she's whispering. She didn't want to say that. There'll be an odor. He's been dead four days. Jesus, he, he's, he's really dead. He's, he's done. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you'd see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and his feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Then Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. The old preacher once said, listen, it's a good thing Jesus named Lazarus by name, because if not, every single person in every grave in Jerusalem would have come up. Jesus, he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. I have the power over death. I have the power over, over eternity. I have the power over Satan. Watch what I can do. And friends, what he was saying is, listen, the reason we can have some hope today is not just that there's life after death. It's not just that our loved ones who knew Christ are alive in heaven. It is the fact that, listen, Jesus said, there's not just life after death. There's life after life after death. Y'all stay with me now. Come on. I lost 90% of you just like <laughs> mouth open. There's life after life after death. Listen, Lazarus, his soul goes to be with, with God in heaven. But when Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth, his soul gets the call to come right back down into his body. I think Lazarus might have been a little bummed about that. Why in the world did you call me back? Why in the world did you bring me back down to this? But the reality is, listen, when Lazarus got unwrapped from those grave clothes, he was the same man they'd known, the same brother they'd known, but now he had seen the face of God. And I want to tell you something, listen. The question we asked a few minutes ago was this. How do we keep our Easter hope alive when what we experience is so often the opposite of Easter? One word, y'all, resurrection. Resurrection. I love what Tim Keller said about resurrection. The biblical view of things is resurrection, not a future that is just a consolation for the life we never had. Hey, I know you died young, but, but it's going to be okay. Now you're in heaven. Hey, I know you went through some terrible stuff down there, but now you've got some nice trophies and rewards. It is not just a consolation for the life we never had, but a restoration of the life you always wanted. This means that every horrible thing that ever happened will not only be undone and repaired, but will in some way make the eventual glory and joy even greater. Friends, the promise of this book is that in all the mud and the blood, in all the pain and all the sorrow and all the violence and all the horror caused by that original sin back in the garden, in all the political turmoil and the mess and the hate and the, in all of that, listen, because Jesus Christ came down to this earth and died on a cross and three days later came out of a borrowed tomb alive, he is restoring it all. He is bringing earth 
back to what it was intended to be. He is bringing his children to what we were intended to be, still in human bodies, still with our personalities, still you, but a perfect you now, able to live forever, able to praise him forever, able to work forever with no sickness and no aging and no sin and no jealousy and no racism and no pain and no violence and no hate. Listen, everything God built you to be because of Jesus, he's bringing it all back around. And listen, all the pain today is somehow going to be exploded into good. God is going to take the worst stuff and work it around in his mix to mean even more glory for him in the end and even more good for you. The resurrected king is resurrecting me. Here's the thing. If I were to tell you that on this Easter Sunday, we had seasoned cowboy tickets available for somebody under one of these chairs in here. Now check under your chair. I'm not, it ain't there. That's the meanest thing ever, right, on Easter. Some people would go out of their minds Why doesn't this necessarily excite us? And not just y'all, me too. Because if that cowboy, if it was here, like, I'd probably be like, happy Easter, y'all, out. One last word here. Jesus counsels. Look at verse 25. We're almost through. Verse 25. Jesus told her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asked this question, do you believe this? And that's personal, isn't it? That's beyond a book. That's beyond a sermon. That's beyond Easter. That's beyond theology. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Friend, one day, listen to me. These flowers won't be for Easter. They will be for you. Dozens and dozens of times now I've stood right here when that casket is rolled right here. And your friends are sitting right there. And I tell your story. Every single one of us, listen to me, will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The day will come when everything we've worked for, everything we've collected, everything we've built, it's fine, there's nothing wrong. All the hobbies, all the cars and the homes and the stuff, and it will all go to the junkyard. There will come a time when all of our popularity and all the acclaim we've gotten and all the opinion of people that we've worked so hard, it will all go to the cemetery. And it will be you standing naked as the day you were born before your God. And the only thing that will matter that day is did you really believe that he's the resurrection and the life? Did you really believe that the point of all this is really Jesus? I walked out of that dump that day down. It's opposite of Easter. But Chuck wasn't done with the tour yet. Um, The next place we went was a feeding center in the dump. And there was a guy by the name of Hector And Hector is a public school teacher in Guatemala City. That means he doesn't make a whole lot of money. I guarantee you that. 
But Hector believes that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God, and he really is the life, and he really is the resurrection. And so Hector can't help but come every day to the dump in Guatemala. And he's feeding children. Look at this next one. He's feeding kids every day and preaching the gospel through manna worldwide. And look at this next picture here. Seeing lives like this one get changed forever. The truth is, she may never make it out of the dump. That little girl may grow up like probably her parents grew up, never really escaping all of the darkness of that place. But I'll tell you one thing can make her happier than the most wealthy American on earth. One thing can give her peace that a billionaire may not have. One thing can give her a clarity in her heart about life that all the possessions in the world can't give. She can know the resurrection and the life, Jesus Christ. She can know there's more to life than this life. And this one is the small bit. And that one is the big bit. And this is just the rehearsal. But that's the real play. And she can make preparations now to be who God built her to be then. I don't know exactly what you're going through. I don't know exactly what pain, what darkness you might have passed through that left you bitter and a little jaded. I don't know if maybe you're right in the middle of something right now. I don't know about that, my friend, but I want to tell you we love you. God loves you. And Jesus Christ not only died on a cross for you, he came back from the dead to rescue you. And I want to promise you this. He wants to know you very personally today. Martha, do you believe, do you believe that I'm really the resurrection and the life? Yeah, Lord, I do. Because if you really believe it, it changes everything, doesn't it? I want to talk to somebody here. Listen, you know all, you're the one I'm most worried for on this Easter Sunday. It's sitting in my notes. It's on my heart. Because you grew up in church and you know all the language and you know all the songs and you knew exactly what to wear today and you've got all that down. But the truth is Jesus is a name and a book to you like George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. He did some great stuff. And you think highly of him. And you prayed a prayer when you were seven and so you're sure you're on your way to heaven. And friend, the thing I want to tell you is today, listen to me. He's the resurrection and the life today. You know what being a Christ follower is? It means you're following him today. You know him today. You have a relationship with him today. He's changing how you talk and changing how you walk and changing how you live today. Oh, listen. He won't just save you from the horrors of, of, of what we go through in this life. He will save you from wasting your life. The opposite of Easter. But Jesus came and he died and he rose again to change it all.